I've read another a book by Alexa Martin before Intercepted, and I was intrigued to see what she would do outside of the sports romance. It's still based in Denver, which I think is her place, and I'm totally fine with that. The story follows Drew, who has recently inherited the bookstore her grandmother started and owned when she passed, this romance author, Jasper. And it is almost a reverse grumpy sunshine. Drew is definitely grumpier. She is most likely clinically depressed after the death of her grandmother and still dealing with a lot of those feelings. Whereas Jasper is so sweet and golden retriever cinnamon roll game for anything. He pretty much is smitten from the first. You can kind of tell. Everyone around them tells Drew that Jasper has fallen for her and she doesn't believe him. So, you know baggage. Also a lot of daddy issues, but they get resolved in a really good way. They end up engaging in this teacher exchangey thing where Drew, who isn't really a book person, she's actually a photographer, takes Jasper around Colorado to show him her favorite places so he can get inspired for his book. And Jasper in turn takes her on bookish dates and gives her books to read that he thinks she'll like. And they bond and they get together and it's very comical. There is an altitude sickness scene that I love. It was unexpected in a way that I giggled profusely at. I enjoyed it. Jasper, I find a little bit boring as a human. He doesn't feel very complex. That's not a bad thing. The entire story is from Drew's point of view. So we're just getting her side of the story. But in general, he feels a little, a little white bread to me. Nothing wrong with a little white bread. They do have a one bed scenario. There is a lot of empowerment. There is a lot of connection, which I enjoyed. For their intimacy, there's really only one scene that we get to be a part of, and then it's just talked about as, isn't it great when you're getting good on the regular? And that's good for you, but I want, I want more. They talk a really good game. There's a lot of consent conversation. There's all the stuff that I want in intimacy in this, but I feel in the same way that I did after Intercepted. They were clearly intimate as a couple, but we weren't privy to view their intimacy. And that's your choice. That is totally a choice that an author can make. Drew is also biracial. Her mom is black. Her dad is white. He is an asshole. And she has this very tense relationship with her half-sister. That was a really good side plot. She has a best friend that is just mwah. I love the best friends that Alexa Martin has written in both Intercepted and here. They add a lot of comedic relief, a lot of insight, and just some levity to a little bit of a grump that Drew can be. Overall, this was a really good book if you enjoy romance. If you're dealing with grief yourself right now, this might not be the book for you. There's a scene at the end where it is revealed that Drew's grandmother really had plans for her unbeknownst to her when it came to her death in the inheritance of this bookstore. And that was the moment that I actually liked best in this book was the way that the grandma loved Drew. There's nothing wrong with Drew and Jasper. They're they're great. They're, they're a couple. They're romance. But when it came to something that really tugged on my heartstrings, Drew's love for her grandma and her grandma's love for her is what really did it for me. If you've read anything else by Alexa Martin, let me know. I know she has more of those sports romance books. I don't know if I'm going to keep going with that, but this was a really lovely one. I read Icon and Inferno by Marie Lu, and this is the sequel to Stars and Smoke, which is a technically new, a spies rock star, not even romance. They don't end up together. I can't even say romance, but I can now. So this was the sequel. Icon and Inferno, Winter and Sydney are back together for another spy adventure. And this one goes horribly wrong. In Stars and Smoke, you had the ending go crazy, like all spy movies. This one goes crazy really early on. The disaster of a mission that they have is akin to, you know, a Mission Impossible movie, but without the cool gadgets. What I was looking for in this book is the next step of their relationship. Of course I was. Of course I was. They were so sweet and so into each other and they overcame this hard thing in the last book and then they were torn apart by the circumstances of their life. In this book, they are brought back together. Both of them have been pining for the other separately as over a year has gone by and then 
Sydney shows back up in Winter's life. Oh man, that first moment is amazing. What I didn't love was the miscommunication thrust upon them, immediately sending them back to almost square one of their relationship. They got salty with each other. They got sassy. They're mad because they're repressing these feelings for the other. And that annoyed me. It is rare that miscommunication doesn't annoy me. And this this was not the exception. Then they go into this mission and it fails so spectacularly. What we see for most of this book is them fighting through these terrible circumstances that they now find themselves in. They're trapped in another country. They're on the run. The police are after them. How do they cross the border? How do they escape? Oh my gosh, there's a turncoat in their midst. Who is it? How do they stop them? What are their feelings for one another? It really felt action adventure-y. I will say that Marie Lu writes the action very well. In the first book, we got a makeout scene and that was it. There wasn't really a description of sex other than both of them admitting that they've had it. Congratulations, you're not a virgin. I actually like knowing that. But in this book, the descriptions of the intimacy they've had with their exes is more than we get in the night they share together. And they don't even explicitly say they have sex. I'm assuming because I'm a dirty girl like that, but it's not explicitly stated. So how am I supposed to know that? Also, I don't appreciate that I got more details of your stupid ass ex-girlfriend and not your time with Sydney. That wasn't fair. I think Marie, from looking up other stuff of hers, I'm pretty sure she sticks mostly into the YA, slightly new A genre. So this might be where I stop, but there is a really touching resolution at the end of this book that for me made it worth it. Oh, oh my gosh. Ooh, my heart. I don't even know how to start this. Before I Let Go by Kennedy Ryan is a book that you should read. And stop. Before I Let Go by Kennedy Ryan is not an easy read. You will be screaming for resolution and love the entire time you are reading it. And it is still worth it. I have to back up. You have Yaz and Sai. Yasmin. Josiah. And when we enter the story, they are two years past their divorce. They've gone through some really hard shit. Please check your trigger warnings. Kennedy Ryan does a really great job with her author's note, but there is death, pregnancy loss, depression, lots of suicide. It has caused their marriage to unravel. When we meet them, really, I know there, there are flashbacks and the flashbacks are done so well. When we meet them, they are really just moving past this divorce. And Yaz, who has been in the midst of this terrible depression, is finally on a regime of meds that work for her, has found a therapist that works for her, is stepping back into life after these tragic losses. Sai has been in motion the whole time. That is his coping mechanism. He has kept moving forward, whereas Yaz stayed still. And one of my favorite things about this book is that it starts with, this is Yaz's fault. Yaz gave up. She ended the marriage. And what they both discover along the way is how it was not Yaz. It was their relationship. Sai couldn't sit still, couldn't deal with his feelings, couldn't engage with this loss he and Yaz had. She needed to sit still and breathe and be, and he wouldn't let her. And as they go through that, as they learn this, they're able then at the end to come together as a much stronger couple. There were moments when I wasn't sure this was a romance, and I just had to trust that. I'd heard enough about Kennedy Ryan being an incredible romance author that this would end happily, and it did, and it is worked for. But if you're looking for a fluffy, easy rom-com that's not going to cause your heart to slightly break and splinter and then get put back together, don't read this book. If you need a palate cleanser, don't read this book. If you want to read some incredible writing, if you want to read characters that are believable, that are heartbreaking, that are honest, that are building themselves up after tragedy, read this book. If you want to read about ripping away the prejudice and the bias and the bullshit around therapy and how it's actually useful and important and can help both men and women read this book. I'm not sad that it took me so long to read it because this book is heavy and I definitely needed to be in the place to read it. But I am so glad that I did read it. This is a book 
where I feel like as an adult, I can dive in and relate and see hope at the end of the tunnel for adult relationships, for real problems. That is an important story to tell. The fantastical stories, yeah, it's great. But sometimes you need a little hope for your real life relationship. And this book, I think this book would give you that. Y'all, I like this book so much as a book. I didn't even talk about the spice, but the spice is spicy. That's all I'm going to say. This is, this review has gone on too long, but the spice is spicy. is saying, oh man, I love the way that they talk about it. I love the way that they, I love the way that it's written. I love the passion that they have and the connection that it brings. And also how we see their spice level evolve from before the tragedy to after the tragedy. Jesus fucking Christ, Kennedy Ryan, what did you do to me? I read The Friend Zone by Abby Jimenez. I feel like I was lied to. All people talk about with Abby Jimenez is the banter and the sweetness. And that might be because of the series that just finished, that trilogy that just completed earlier this year. But I went back to the beginning. I committed and I read The Friend Zone, which, yes, has incredible banter between Kristen and Josh. I did not expect the tragedy that this book was going to contain. Oh my gosh. I stayed up late to finish this book because after the motorcycle accident, I didn't trust her to give me the resolution that I needed. This spoiler, spoiler, spoilers, all the spoilers. But Kristen and Josh are the best friends of this couple. There's a really funny meet cute with a fender bender. I don't need to get into that. The banter is good. Kristen has a long-term boyfriend who is deployed. Josh ends up getting hired by Kristen to build dog staircases just go with friends but it does make sense all he's building they banter they flirt and this connection grows josh has stated as they've gotten to know each other that he comes from a big family he wants a big family and Kristen has uterine fibroids that have made her life so miserable two weeks after the wedding they're in she is planning to get a hysterectomy while she actually falls in love with josh she doesn't tell josh because she doesn't want him to know and she doesn't want him to feel like he's settling because she has her own emotional stuff to deal with. But basically what it feels like to everyone else is she's just pushing Josh away. They've got this great banter. They've got this great chemistry, but she will not commit. And he has no idea why. Of course he has no idea why. She will not tell him. And that's not fair. It was like miscommunication along the whole book. If you'd said something earlier, then a lot of these things might have been avoided. They end up hooking up and she keeps pushing him in a way. She says it's friends with benefits. He's pushing for more. And then this fucking tragedy happens. They eventually have a happily ever after and it's great but I was not expecting for that last chunk of the book to be a pseudo tragedy about the loss that their best friends are experiencing. I was not ready for it. Ultimately I don't know if it enhanced the story. Let me know if that's really important for later. One of the things that really drew me into the story was the conversation Kristen had about her attraction to Josh. She admitted that she was attracted and she said, oh shit, I better not put myself in a situation where I could cheat. The way you avoid cheating is don't put yourself in a compromising situation to begin with. I agree with that. I think that is absolutely true. If you don't put yourself out there flirting with someone that you're attracted to or alone with someone you're attracted to, you're not going to cheat. The way that she does this is by dressing like an absolute slob around Josh for the first part of this book. And that made me laugh so hard because Josh then picked up on that and went, wow, she's not attracted to me at all. She has curlers in her hair. And that is exactly what should happen. You set up boundaries and the other person holds those boundaries. Now, when the boyfriend breaks up with her in voicemail, all bets are off. And the chemistry is great and the sex is great and fun and flirty. But I cannot get over the tragedy that was the last bit of this book. Are all her books like this? How was I going to stay away from a fake dating game show romance? I wasn't. I found The Fake Dating Game by Timothy Janowski. It is exactly that. Holden 
has been obsessed with this game show because his mom was. She died of cancer and they bonded over this. So when he springs a trip to California on his boyfriend, Brandon, to go try out for the show and Brandon dumps him in the restaurant, what is he supposed to do but go by himself, completely heartbroken? Where he meets Leo, the concierge, who then calls him that night because he's crying really loud and listening to loud, sad music. And Leo shows up with pizza and Monopoly. That is the sweet thing ever. It also helps that Leo's hot. By the time Leo shows up with the Monopoly and the pizza, Holden is trashed. One of my favorite parts of this book is the amount of times they are interrupted from having sex. It is just constantly, uh, are we going to, no, okay, okay, your mom came home. Are we going to, oh, no, you're late for work. Are we going to, no, you're too drunk. It is so funny to me, but it does mean that when they get together, you really feel like they've earned it. Holden then invites Leo to be his partner to try out for this game show and they practice and they meet and they teach each other and they spend time together and they learn about each other and Holden meets his mom and then they get on the game show. I mean like the game show part is fun and flirty and all these things. What happens between Holden and Leo is that two people who were never supposed to meet and never supposed to form a relationship show up with all of their baggage just here. Hey, I didn't clean up my baggage because you're not staying. You're temporary. You live in New York and I'm here in LA. It doesn't matter. I didn't hide it in the closet for you. It's just still all laying out unpacked. When you do that, when you're able to be your most authentic, vulnerable self with another human being, that's when those deep, fast emotional connections can happen and feel real to me. When you are hiding or on your best behavior in a relationship, how can you be authentic? How are you even open to receiving the baggage or the vulnerability that your partner is sharing with you? If you're hiding yourself, are you even listening when your partner is expressing their authentic self? So because Holden and Leo are just, here's everything I got right away, they genuinely get to know each other and care for each other and have fun together. Their chemistry is so good. This spice is spicing and there's light kink involved. There's safe words, there's tying, there's hand signals, there's a sir moment, and I am all about it. There's not miscommunication, but there's some bullshit third act breakup shit that goes on. While I didn't like how it was handled, I didn't mind it because I also knew that one, this is a romance novel. And two, I had maybe 50 pages left. This was not going to be a long, drawn out situation. This was a really nice palate cleanser after before I let go in the friend zone. Yeah. <laughs>